Joining us now for the interview is Bill Maher, the host of Real Time with Bill Maher on HBO. Bill Maher, it is nice to see you. Thanks for being here. Always good to see you, Rachel. Um, the, the Occupy Wall Street protesters today, Bill, uh, they took a tour of Wall Street billionaires' homes um, in New York City, uh, noting, among other things, that New York's special millionaires tax expires at the end of this year. There's been this surtax on millionaires in New York, but yet all these millionaires are still here. Uh, I wonder if you feel like the Occupy Wall Street um, protests are resonating, are, are, have, have come up with at least an, a vague message that is speaking to people who may not be participating in those protests yet. Absolutely. I think it's a great thing. Uh, I, on our show, we've talked for the longest time about how what the left needs is something to put the wind at the back of the president and other Democrats who, as you know, have a tendency to falter toward the side of, shall we say, centrism. Uh, and this could be it. You know, so what that their message is a little vague? I kind of like it that they're sort of militantly vague at this point. Uh, because they are, in a lot of ways, the opposite of the Tea Party movement. Although that's sort of weird also, because the Tea Party movement, let's, let's remember, start, sort of started out as protesting some of the same things. Remember the bailouts of the banks? They didn't like the big banks. It just shows how easily the people in the Tea Party can be herded to something else. They were sort of on the same page as these folks, but then they started to watch Fox News and they found out, no, what they were really upset about was things like Obamacare and taxing the job creators. And somehow they wound up on the wrong side of the issue again. The Tea Partiers, though, I feel like I feel like you're right that where they ended up was just being a really awesome brand name for what is always the conservative base of the Republican Party. But I think back to the, the Rick Santelli yeah. call from the stock exchange in Chicago and the bailout that he was angry about, that he called for that first Chicago Tea Party, was not a, he wasn't angry about a mm -hmm. bank bailout. He was angry about the idea that people with mortgages might get bailed out, individual homeowners might get bailed out, and that was the outrage. So I don't know, I feel like the origin myth of the Tea Party is something that's even screwed up in my own mind. I'm not sure they were ever anti-bank. I'm not sure they were ever even uh, that much about financial issues, which is what they purport to be about. But when you, of course, look deep into the Tea Party, not that they're really that deep, uh, <laughs> There, there are, you know, it's sort of the same stuff that we've had in this country going back to the Birchers. It seems like the Republican Party uh, periodically gets taken over by a group of people, the Birchers in the 50s, uh, then in the 80s, remember it was the, the values voters types, the Christian coalition, now it's the Tea Party people. Uh, and it seems like it's one of those viruses that every time it comes back, it comes back a little stronger and more dangerous. Um, and that seems what we have here. I mean, a lot of really what we find out about the Tea Party and their agenda, despite the fact that they're named after a gay sex act, is, uh, is really social <laughs> issues. You know, they're really, <laughs> they're really mad at the same things that those, those pants-wetting nativists have always been worried about. I wonder, though, if you, I mean, you just think back on this year, even just the year in stupid punditry, and the amount of power that has been ascribed <laughs> to the Tea Party movement. I mean, they're, they're seen as essentially driving all Republican political decisions at this point. In, is that in part because they were seen as being so... Um, potentially, because they were seen as being potentially violent, because they were seen as an unruly mob. I was thinking about that as we see Eric Cantor and these other Republican congressmen denouncing the Occupy Wall Street people as, you know, an angry mob and somehow dangerous to the country. I wonder if a sense of dangerousness is what gives them power. Well, yeah, I think so. I don't think anyone uh, feels that we're in a country like so many in the world. Let's remember we are luckier than most. Um, where violence really is going to rule the day and affect policy. But yeah, people can be in, in, intimidated by that kind of thing. I mean, this idea that they're marching now on millionaires' homes, I couldn't help but think of that scene in um, the Martin Scorsese movie, Gangs of New York, where the riots break out in New York and, and Martin Scorsese has that, has that cameo where he plays the, the rich guy you know, he's in his Fifth Avenue apartment and a <laughs> brick comes through the window. Well, you know, if a brick came through Rupert Murdoch's window, yes, I, I have a feeling Fox News would be a lot more gentle on the Wall Street people. <laughs> um, 
in terms of the way that Republicans are dealing with this, I mean, it's interesting enough to see Democrats dealing with this, trying to decide how much they want to embrace the idea of some movement outside politics as having their message. But Republicans, I think, are also changing their message toward it, too. In one day, Mitt Romney went from describing Occupy Wall Street as dangerous uh, to saying he understands how these people feel and he worries about the 99 percent. I mean, that's Mitt Romney's evolution on the subject over the course of one day on the campaign trail. Is that does that tell you more about Mitt Romney or does that tell you that there, there may be seeing some political cost in denouncing these folks? Well, I must say, if you're trying to say Mitt Romney's a flip flopper, that does not resonate with me. <laughs> That's not the Mitt Romney I ever remember. But if you're going to try to sell that, I'm buying it. <laughs> uh, no, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Who knows what Mitt Romney is saying from one day to the next. Uh, but I, he said uh, in the debate, the last debate, that he wanted everyone to be rich. That seems to be the line. Uh, <clears throat> from the Republican Party, which of course is just a complete fantasy. Herman Cain, of course, uh, famously said recently that if you're not rich, blame yourself. This is what really bothers me, this idea that somehow we can all be rich. What, what, I mean, among the stupid things, and you really have to dig deep to, to you know, have that contest, which is the stupidest. That is one of the stupidest things I've ever heard any politician say. I want everybody to be rich. First of all, if everybody was rich, who would do the things that rich people hire people to do for them? Who's going to be my footman, my toady, my liposuctionist? Rich people need poor people to work for them. And this idea that, uh, that Herman Cain said that, you know, if you're not rich, blame yourself. They, that this is what bothers me about rich people. They don't, uh, first of all, as Elizabeth Warren said, they don't, they don't cotton to the idea that they wouldn't be rich if they didn't have this great country that provides the roads and the schools and all the other things that allow them to be rich. But also this idea they never understand that it's a fluke, mostly, that what you do is something that made you rich. Yes, if you throw a baseball 100 miles an hour, or even what I do. I, I mean, I'm not humble about some things. I'm very humble about the fact that telling jokes is something that gets you a lot of money. That is a complete fluke. And so is owning pizza parlors. Yes, Herman Cain was good at business. Great, he became very rich from it. But what about teachers and cops and firemen? You know, those people we always say are our heroes. They're such heroes that we pay them like crap. Well, they, would, they do what they do very well. It just doesn't happen to be something that is ever going to make you rich. So this idea that if you're not rich, blame yourself, oh, really bugs me but I tried to hide it. Bill Mark, can you hold on one second and come right back with us in just a moment? No, I can't. I'm <laughs> just going off right now. We'll keep the camera on. Okay, yes. hold on. Hold on one second. Okay. Joining us once again is Bill Maher, the host of Real Time with Bill Maher on HBO. Bill, thanks very much for sticking with us. Great to have you here. I've calmed down, Rachel. I've calmed down. <laughs> well, I'd like to get you more excited by talking to you again about Mitt Romney, who I know okay. gets your blood pumping. <laughs> um, Chris, oh, good. <laughs> Chris Christie uh, has endorsed Mitt Romney now. Tim Pawlenty today said that he wishes he was back in the race, which is a little odd given that he is Mitt Romney's campaign co-chairman now. It's hard to make the case for that guy being the guy for the country when you say that you wish that you had stayed in the race to beat him. Uh, what do you right. make of the Republican Party's dissatisfaction uh, with Mr. Romney, even as they seem to be picking him as their nominee? Well, you know, it's, it's funny. I mean, it's, it's delightful for someone who doesn't like the Republicans. <laughs> I'm enjoying them watching them peck at, pick at each other. I mean, you have to understand that the Republicans, I think, basically cannot find a person that they really like because they really don't like people. They like people in general. They like people in the abstract. If you show a soldier, you know, in a sunset and put the syrupy music behind it, they get all teary like John Boehner. But if that soldier then opens his mouth and says he's gay, they'll boo him right out of the room. So I think that's part of it. They really just don't like human beings. You know, they like Ayn Rand, who doesn't like human beings. Um, and as far as Mitt Romney, you know, uh, 
I was reading an interesting poll today that said most Republicans still are not even familiar with Mitt Romney. They can't even name the people who are running. This isn't just Americans. This is Republicans who you'd think would be a little more interested. I don't think they really know who he is yet. So he's still kind of defining himself. And of course, you have so much to pick from to define because he's been on every side of every issue, as we as we know. What really is going to be the problem for Mitt, for Mitt Romney is uh, the Mormonism thing. I don't think the flip-flopping thing bothers people anymore. They kind of accept that politicians are always full of it and all over the map and you can't trust them and they say one thing and do another. But the religion stuff in this dumb religious country, that's going to be a problem for Mitt Romney. As we saw this week when Herman Cain, uh, well not Herman Cain, um, um, who outed him? Um, the re well, Rick Perry, the Jeffers guy who was oh, a yeah. Rick Perry surrogate. Yes, Rick Perry outed him as a Mormon and started to play this Mormon card. And when people find out that, you know, Mormonism really is not a branch of Christianity, I think it's going to be a problem for him. When Mitt Romney made his speech in 2007, people compared it to the Kennedy speech in 60. It was nothing like the Kennedy speech. What Kennedy was saying was, I'm a Catholic, yes, but I'm not going to be taking my orders from the Pope. I separate church and state. That's not what Mitt Romney said. What Mitt Romney said was, look, Yes, I'm a Mormon, that's different than a Christian, but what, what's important is that we all believe in nonsense. We could all rally around that. Do, do you think, though, that, I mean, Mitt Romney now has this choice of whether or not to redo that speech that he did before about his faith, or should, I mean, he could also go sort of on the offensive against the people who are calling his religion a cult. I mean, the, it seems like he's counting on this, creating some sympathy for him because his religion has now been attacked by his political rivals. If you were advising Mitt Romney and you wanted him to win the, win the nomination, what would you tell him to say about this? I mean, he's, he's sort of in a box, isn't he? Well, yeah, I mean, I would advise him to become a Protestant and uh, I'm, I'm sure he would have no problem doing that because he's Mitt Romney. He is the ultimate shapeshifter. If a poll came out tomorrow that said he could get elected easier if he was a black woman, uh, he would have the sex change operation tomorrow, get a weave <laughs> and rename himself Letitia. Uh, I have no doubt about that. But, uh, you know, he's not going to do that, of course. Uh, you know, he's going he's gonna to downplay it as he did before. It kind of kind of gloss over this idea that Mormonism is a completely different religion as it is from Christianity. He's going to try to sell this idea that we're all, you know what, this is just a different, different branch of Christianity. No, it's not. I was raised Catholic. I don't remember anything about magic underwear or baptizing dead people or getting your own planet to rule over when you die. Mormonism, I mean, look, all religion is nuts, but Mormonism just takes it to a different level. I mean, all religion is, a, is magic tricks. Mormonism is just a particularly cheap novelty store brand of magic trick. Please address your commentary, Rachel Maddow Show viewers, to Bill Maher, the host of HBO's Real Time with Bill Maher. Bill, can I ask you one last question about the Democratic side of things right now? Absolutely. All right. Uh, President Obama right now has this jobs program, right? He's got the, it's, it's infrastructure investment, it's uh, middle class tax cuts, it's all these hiring incentives, and he's got Republicans 100% uniformly allied against him on this for all the obvious reasons. But he cannot get Democrats uniformly behind him on this. He cannot get unanimity from the senators in his own party that they should support his jobs plan. Is that just in the nature of Democrats at this point, or is there anything that they can do to sort of get in line on this? Well, that's a great question. I don't know if they can get them in line, but I would agree with you that that is one of the big problems in this country is uh, we understand that the Republicans are mostly bad policymakers who are trying retreaded ideas that didn't work the first time. What's especially disappointing is that group of Democratic senators, you know, the Ben Nelsons, these, these same types, these centrist corporatist Democrats who ally with them. Uh, you know, it's bad enough that you need 60 votes, which is kind of a quiet coup in our government, because mm -hmm. really the Constitution says it should be 51, to get something done. When you add the fact that there's 53 Republican, I mean, 53 Democratic senators, 40 of them are pretty good, but there's that 13 that call themselves centrists that really wind up with the Republicans, and then, of course, nothing is ever going to get done. 
And this is, again, to come back to what we started to talk about, why I think that uh, Occupy Wall Street movement is so important. Because the left needs some, something to, to move them away from the center and toward the left. Um, you know, we've tried conservatism in this country, we've tried centrism. We need something to make us try liberal policies. Bill Maher, the host of HBO's Real Time with Bill Maher.